hi, hello everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, happy Hanukkah for those uh, um, celebrating. Uh, I'm Kim Fasiosef, uh, streaming to you live from Tel Aviv, Israel. And together with me is my wonderful co-host, Aziza Bussera uh, from South Carolina. Hi, Aziz. Hello, how are you? Doing well. So we already have two guests with us, but um, before we start, we'll just say that um, we're talking about Morocco today. I haven't been myself. Have you been, Aziz? No, I've been very close. I've been in Tunis, but not in Morocco. So just on the border next by. <laughs> um, so I, I will share, though, a personal connection to Morocco. Um, my husband's mother is, was born in Morocco. Um, the funny thing is that she came to Israel when she was about one years old, and they couldn't say what her birthday is, uh, her birth date. Uh, so when she was grown, uh, they, you know, they chose a random date for her, and that's what she usually celebrated because her mom, you know, she would say, it's somewhere around this holiday, and they kind of guessed. And she decided to travel to Morocco, go to the hospital where she was born and figure out when was she born. And then they told her that the specific year that she was born, the, all of the documents <laughs> are not there because of a fire that happened in the hospital. So the rest of the years, yes. Um, she kind of feels like maybe there was some sort of uh, you know, miscommunication in the hospital, she doesn't speak the language, so I'm, I'm assuming she'll go back and try to figure that out, but just a funny anecdote um, to open the conversation with. Um, do you want to start with our guest, Aziz? Are you still trying to go on live on Facebook? I am, and it's taking, uh, it's taking a while. So uh, okay. yeah, why don't you lead with that and I'll try to see if there's something I can do on the Facebook aspect. Sure. And I know so, our third uh, guest is trying to get on and hopefully Shanna will be helping him. Great, wonderful. Um, well, well, we'll actually start with you, Adina. Um, and as you know, or might not know our listeners, um, we run tours to Morocco and Adina is our, our partner there. Um, and we'd love to hear from you a bit, Adina. How did you even get to Morocco to begin with? Well, is it okay, first of all, that I share a screen while I talk Definitely. in the background? Okay, just because there are so many pictures, too many to... So I actually, um, so I, I'm American and Israeli, and I had for many years wanted to go visit Morocco. And finally, in uh, 2005, I had, a, um, I had a free ticket, and I thought, hmm, where should I go? I, I knew a few people in Morocco, so off I went to Morocco in the summer of 2005, thinking that it would be, you know, maybe my my only trip or one of a few. But I ended up um, meeting someone there and also getting very interested and, you know, engaged with the country. So I've been going back there regularly. I actually got married there. So my daughter um, has family there whom we visit uh, and but I combined business and pleasure. So we have family, but we also, uh, from my first visit, I was, I remember thinking, wow, this is such a gold mine in terms of the, the themes and the, the things we can elicit from it that would interest travelers from Israel and from the Middle East at large and from the US, which is why I kept, you know, going back. Um, yeah, I forgot if there's how, another. How yeah. How long did it take you before you brought others to travel with you? Well, I went, so first it was for family, you know, I went back and uh, to visit the family I had met and um, got married eventually. Um, but, but even during that time, I would bring uh, small groups, one or two people at a time, mostly Israelis who uh, had a foreign passport and could come to Morocco more easily. Then when I had a wedding there, another few people came, including my family members and uh, my best friend. So then that included tours. And then it was in 2012 was the first official student tour. Uh, and since then it's been students from the US, 
Israelis, um, American Jews, other Americans who are not necessarily Jewish, et cetera. So a number of different kinds of groups, uh, either independently through, through Mejdi tours, sometimes through the university. Yeah. So basically since 2012. Amazing. Can you tell us a bit what, uh, what you like most about showing uh, people Morocco or even just give us a brief about uh, the trip to Morocco that you leave? Okay. Okay, so so when I went there again, as a particularly as a Jew who grew up in Israel, who's from Ashkenazi background, but grew up among Moroccan Moroccans as well, and others of course, um, and who eventually ended up writing about Palestinian issues because that was something I had not that had been kind of invisible to me uh, most of my life. Then suddenly the the Moroccan experience became much more obvious to me and I thought wow there's so much more that everybody in Israel and the, the US who cares about the region in general could learn and so when I when I take groups there it's really we focus on a few things that Amina will talk about a little bit about women empowerment and interfaith work through that as well through sustainable development Sadiq will talk about some other cultural things uh, so there's there are a few themes but I always feel that you can't really address those themes without getting a picture of Morocco. So here's just an example. Uh, I know not everybody can see this, but of my daughter and her two cousins when they were little. So that was a long time ago, 10 years ago. But basically Morocco is just amazing in terms of the colors, smells, tastes, the, the energy put into designing. And I know this is not only in Morocco, but Morocco is really um, big on this. The patterns, the foods, just, you, you can't get tired in, in that in that sense. And every city is actually um, different when you travel around Morocco. There's a variety of landscapes, like a huge range from snow covered peaks to sand dunes, to other kinds of desert, to coastal Berber villages, Berber Amazir villages, uh, big cities and imperial, you know, uh, architecture. Uh, the, all the new, so modernity and and um, traditional um, ways of doing things, and every city in Morocco, every region is different from the next. Even though you get the gist of some of the things, every city has its own characteristics and its own. Here, these are some of the landscapes. Its own um, art. This is a the Moroccan um, Amazil pharmacies. There's, like I said, modernity and transportation here. You have two extremes on a donkey climbing a 90 degree um, uh, slope or very modern fast trains, uh, different civilizations, wildlife, just all these amazing things. And every city is known for not only its foods, but its, its artisans. They really have, um, even though you can find carpets anywhere, there are some places known for certain kinds of carpets, some places known for certain kinds of other plates or leather or, so you won't be bored, you know, seeing the same thing twice in that sense. And you, you have access to these artisans and also to how, um, not only to the traditional ways, but how modern day society engages with this. So for example, how women cooperations, cooperatives, um, how women are engaged in this. Uh, Morocco is also known for fossils. And so there's an industry around fossils, but there are amazing fossils in nature. There's a major, amazing combination of different cultural groups, Amazir, Ginawa, uh, not Ginawa, yeah, Ginawa, uh, Jews, Muslims, Christian, you know, religious tolerance, relatively speaking, everything's relative, but Morocco's really high on that. A lot of Jewish history, um, museums and different kinds of commemorative places and um, events uh, of Andalusian history or Jewish. They're just culturally so diverse and there are some seasons where it's full of festivals and other events. Here we have the, the King's advisor who's a Jewish, Andrea Zulai, is very accessible and very involved in peace related activities. So he's a regular, anybody who's gone to Morocco engaged in peace work kind of knows about him. Um, but basically all of these different, um, these different attributes um, 
are things that are just just inspiring and amazing. And once you understand that, then when you go get to places like where you were talking about women's empowerment, which I mean, I will elaborate on in Berber villages, you understand what periphery means because you've understood what the landscape means and how how when you're far away, you're really far away. How when women don't go to school or it's challenging for them to go to school, what that really means, challenging, how much you have to walk per day. Da, da, da. So, so basically the trips almost always combine traveling around a, a wide radius, visiting different cities, meeting with people, most importantly, I know Mejdi is, high on, is big on this, but engaging with people and seeing from them what they do and how they do it and why. And then understanding these specific issues of interfaith or women or sustainable development in that broader context. That's okay. my intro. This is this is awesome, and I'm I'm sure like everybody watching, it's if you haven't probably been to Morocco, you you're thinking, this is so beautiful. I I want to be there, and I like how how diverse and how different. But one thing to me is fascinating about Morocco. Uh, we were talking before the, we started broadcasting of, of just, for example, the agreement that happened, uh, was announced today between Israel and Morocco, which I'm sure is going to be in the news. If people haven't heard yet, uh, the U.S. administration just announced that Israel and Morocco will establish or maybe reestablish diplomatic ties. Um, even though Israel and Morocco has always had behind the scenes or at least for quite a long time, had behind the scenes uh, diplomatic ties. Uh, often when, when uh, my Israeli friends would say, you know, we can't uh, travel to any Arab countries, I'll always correct them and say, actually, you can. Morocco has been for at least the last 20 years uh, or so open for Israeli travelers. Uh, so I, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts about that. I mean, you teach conflict resolution. We didn't talk about your background, but you are a conflict resolution professor. This is, this is how we got to meet you and I. Um, but also, how is it for a Jewish person living in Morocco today? You've lived there. How was your relationship with the Muslim community there, with the Barbar Amazi community? Uh, how were you seen? Did people look at you like, oh wait, you're an enemy because you had an Israeli background or were you, did you feel comfortable living there? Okay, so personally, I've also visited places like Jordan, Palestine, Palestinian Authority or before the authority and, and um, Tunisia. And so comparing and Egypt, um, Comparatively, Jew, Morocco is very user-friendly to Israelis and to Jews and takes, uh, makes a lot of effort to make sure that Jews are safe, that anybody is safe, but definitely that Jews and Israelis are safe when they're traveling there. Um, Morocco has also, for, for a long time, um, again, hundreds of thousands of Israelis and many more Jews, probably millions of Jews visit Morocco. Um, and the holy places for Jews in Morocco are very well preserved, actually under the auspices of the king too. So there's, there have been campaigns to renovate um, cemeteries. There are saints, maybe, <clears throat> maybe Sadiq will mention this, um, tombs of saints, which are holy to Jews, but they're also revered by Muslims. Um, there, um, there are provisions in the new constitution of 2011 that that emphasize Jews being, an, slash the Hebrews or the Israelites, being an integral part of Moroccan culture and history. They're actually just in the last few days, they introduced, or very recently, they introduced Jewish history into the Moroccan curriculum for, for kids, for undergrad, for, for elementary schools and high schools. So Jews are seen not, seen not as an anomaly or not as a, a foreign entity, but rather as a very Moroccan thing. And that and Moroccan groups, there are a number of Moroccan groups like Mimuna Association, which are Muslims who are educating themselves and other Muslims about Jews, particularly in Morocco, but because it enhances their Moroccan identity, not because they're doing anyone a favor, because they see to be Moroccan means to endorse all these things. Um, so in that sense, Jews can feel very comfortable. Again, this is too short a time to go into all the history, but of course it's not been perfect. Of course, there are always issues. 
um, including some around politics, more like more with nationalism and Jewish and Arab nationalism and French nationalism. But overall, Jews have done very well in Morocco and um, their numbers are dwindling for, all, again, all kinds of reasons, but, but there's a lot of return. There are a lot of Israelis from Moroccan background going back, uncovering, recovering their ancestral uh, cemeteries, going back to the Amazil villages. There are books. There's a very, very strong campaign and a very deep one, not superficial, like just an agreement. The agreement is great, but really what's going on is a, a much deeper, more organic kind of connection. Jews can visit the homes they came from. It's not really a controversial issue. In Tunisia, that was more sensitive, for example. We couldn't do that, at least now, uh, too openly. Um, but Morocco is not an issue. So I would say for anyone traveling to Morocco, Jewish or not Jewish, Israeli or not Israeli, it's generally speaking a very safe place and very welcoming place um, to go. And um, yeah, I mean, it's safer than a lot. Sometimes it's safer than staying where you are. Um, not necessarily during COVID, but you know, as soon as it's over. It, it sounds like even Israel has something to learn from uh, from Morocco, especially about this, uh, what you said about education. I think uh, Israel is very strong on Jewish education and not strong on, on anything else almost. Um, so that's something to think about too. And um, I've heard from friends Jewish friends, uh, Americans that went to Morocco and actually knocked on the door to, to ask if, you know, did you know my relatives? Did you know my grandmother, my great grandmother? Um, and, and they've been welcomed to coffee and, and meals <laughs> and more than that. So uh, I think that's beautiful to hear. Um, I think we'll, we'll move along to, uh, to our next guest. Um, Adina, do you want to introduce uh, Sadiq? Sadiq joined us. And we'll, I can't see because we'll my... we'll bring him in in a second. Ah, okay. Um, well, Sadiq will tell you maybe a little more about his background. He's a professor of many talents, but he's one of our regular. Like I met him on my first trip to Morocco with a group, and back so back in 2012. And I've been meeting with him and sending groups to meet with him every chance we get. And I know I'm not the only one because he knows. He knows about so many different things, including Sufism, uh, uh, Amazir and Moroccan culture, gender, American studies, anything you want pretty much you could talk about. And I'm sure this will be a great challenge to only talk for a little bit because he can talk for days and you will be engaged listening for days. And he's wonderful. He's had us at his home, different groups. And so welcome Sadiq, nice to not see you yet, but I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Adina, and um, we'll we'll move you to the attendee section and bring you back in uh, by the end. Thank you. Hi, Sadiq. Hi. Um, How are you? I don't know whether or not you see me. We um, can't see you yet. Good. Happy. <laughs> not yet. Um, not yet. Let's see if. Um, I have problems seeing myself. <laughs> uh, I think you. Here we go. All right. Yes. Good. Uh, now I can see myself. So I'm um, very, very happy to be with you today. Very, very glad, in fact, to talk about my culture. Thank you, Adina, for inviting me. Welcome, everybody. I hope that um, I can see you in person in Morocco very soon. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, like Adina said, I can talk about different things. I would be happy to address uh, different aspects of Moroccan culture. Very, very rich, very complex. Um, but I will be, um, I think I will be saying a few things first about um, about how different Morocco is to the rest of the Arab world. Because most of the time, I think uh, the, one of the ways we can understand Morocco is through and learning what we learned about, uh, about the, the region, the MENA region, because sometimes we, we know Morocco via the lens of the Middle East. And uh, we tend to uh, 
to look at uh, the region as though it were one. In fact, Morocco is very different, uh, different in, ter in terms of history, in terms of ethnicity, language, education, history, and everything. Uh, so um, I can address different aspects, but, uh, but uh, one of the aspects we can differentiate Morocco from the rest of the, 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 the Arab world is, uh, like Adina said, Sufism or spirituality, the importance of the cult of saints is very important. Usually it is said that the East is the land of the, the saints and Morocco, uh, the East is the land of the prophets and Morocco is the land of saints. And in fact, we have a very, very rich uh, saint culture and legacy. Uh, you can't inventory the number of saints we have, uh, thousands of them. And uh, just to give a little number, uh, we have over 256 saints that were worshipped by both Jews and Muslims, Moroccan Jews and Moroccan Muslims, uh, including 26 female saints. Of course, to talk about uh, the, the number of Jews, the number of saints that are worshipped only by Jews or exclusively by the Muslims, the number is just uh, uninvented. So uh, one of the, I think one of the angles through which we can, we can understand Moroccan culture is through uh, this very important aspect which is spirituality or Sufism and the cult of saints that is uh, very important. More importantly, I think to the present time is that uh, this, uh, the, the worship of saints and sainthood or uh, the, the presence of Sufism in Morocco is very important because it has been used over the last, uh, couple of decades to combat radicalism. So the, it played a very important role. So, and the, the Moroccan state, in fact, promoted uh, Sufism for tourism, for tourism uh, reasons, but also uh, as, uh, as, a ve as a vehicle of uh, combating, uh, combating uh, uh, fundamentalism. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the, the Sufis uh, or this spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual uh, version of uh, Islam uh, teaches us, in fact, to love every single person, irrespective of the religion or their ethnicity or whatever, because for the, 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 the Sufis, uh, we are created of one soul. So uh, loving the other is in fact about loving yourself. And also uh, one of the Sufi patrons would tell us that, uh, uh, that you should not hate the Jew, you should not hate the Christian. Uh, what you should combat in fact is the evil soul inside you. That's it's egoism, it's selfishness. That's what you need to, to be dealing with. Not uh, your enemy is not external. Uh, and, and so you have, there are uh, I've I've come across Sufis in in my travels uh, in places like Bosnia or like Turkey or like uh, the Balkans in in general, yeah. and I know there are different kind of Sufis. So what are the Sufi? Which Sufi groups you have in Morocco, and what are the practices? Is it the the whirling dervishes? Is it is it the ones who do zikr? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And yeah. can you? As right, a, we have we don't have yeah. Can you, as a traveler, Sorry. go and meet with them? Can you, as a traveler, attend anything that the Sufi is doing? In, uh... Yes, 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 definitely you can. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, there's one that is very important in Fez. We, we, we have too many. This is the land of saints. Are, this is the land of Sufism. And in, in fact, it's, it's um, impossible to understand Moroccan Islam outside of the Sufi tradition. It's very important. It's very important for... Uh, Moroccan diplomacy, uh, international diplomacy is very important. But yes, you can. And in fact, there is in Fez, we have one Sufi order, which uh, the, and the, the, the person in charge of this Sufi order is from Canada. And he would uh, host people from all over the place to come to his place in the beautiful Medina of Fez, this uh, real spiritual, beautiful uh, millennial. Uh, Serio Fez that I would really, really invite everybody to come and visit. It's a must. It's a real must. And you can go there and visit and meet Sufi people. Some people, you can't recognize them. They look like you and me. It's hard to know that they are Sufi. But there are, there's a huge number of people who are really Sufi, and you can see it. Uh, yeah. You can see that they are Sufi. And I, they have their orders that you can go visit. 
I think one of my most probably meaning spiritual experience I've had was going to a Sufi uh, zikr uh, meeting in a mosque in, uh, in, in Sarajevo, it was in Bosnia. And it was yeah. such a powerful to walk, to sit and be part yeah. of the circle and to hear them do the, the prayer for those who don't know. It's a lot of it was focused on, yes. you know, a lot of it is repetition, breathing. It almost yes. Like, yes. Uh, this meditation kind of thing. And it was just such a powerful thing. And I, I, I had travelers with me who many of them couldn't understand Arabic. Uh, and didn't know much necessarily about Islam, but were extremely moved uh, by it. And, and, and yet Sufism, yeah. by yeah. many, you know, I come from Palestine, many, uh, or some at least, Arab Muslims, when they look at Sufism, they don't, there's some, I mean, Sufism was persecuted in, in oh, yeah, Islam, and some don't see it as really part of Islam. But you're saying in Morocco, yeah. that's not the case. Yes, yes, yeah. In Morocco and in many parts of the world, yeah, that's true, that's true, yeah. Uh, Orthodox Islam, uh, lots of, uh, of people, but in, they have this very, very uh, antagonistic relation with Sufism. Of course, it's hard to talk about Sufism in, in, in a few minutes, but it's very complex. And um, I would, for example, in, in America, when Sufism started to spread in America, people, Americans who didn't understand Arabic, but they were, they, they were part of the trance and this in the zikr session they were like you said they were moved because the, in fact the sufis think that uh, in a sense whether you're muslim or atheist or jew or or christian there is something in a sense that brings us together and this is something that we need to promote um, and uh, then it, it goes the trance for example this ecstatic uh, feeling that uh, the sufis refer to as uh, drunkenness is, it goes beyond language, be, goes beyond words, and it can be experienced by any, any single person, irrespective of their religion, even when they are not uh, religious. Right. And Kim, I know you probably have some questions, but I just want to remind everyone, please feel free to ask as we're going, especially since we're talking about Sufism, is if anybody has a, has some questions about uh, Sufism, it's its, its own at some point we might have to do a full show just talking about Sufism because it is fascinating and yeah. uh, really interesting like what you were saying. I know people who consider themselves Sufis but they are not Muslim, which is... Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I actually yeah. have a <laughs> friend who would travel to meet Sufi teachers around the world and considers herself a dedicated Sufi Jew. And I never thought such a thing. I, mean, I know Kabbalah exists in that world. It's kind of closer to Sufi. <laughs> a non-Muslim can be considered a Sufi. Yeah. So it's its own world. So Crazy. you have some questions. I, I wanted to ask um, what role Sufism played in Morocco um, or in Muslim Jewish history. Yeah, in fact, uh, for for the Muslims, when you call it Sufi only if it's part of Islam, uh, that's the uh, esoteric dimension of the religion. If it's not part of Islam, it's not called Sufi. But uh, uh, but of course, it, it looks very Sufi. Kabbalah, uh, for example. So I think there's the, the uh, mystical uh, uh, mystical experience, the same, especially the cult of saints, and it's very important that in, in Morocco. I don't know about uh, other places of the world, but in Morocco, it's very important to see uh, Jews and Muslims going together, especially when we're talking about uh, not the high Sufi tradition or spiritual tradition, I'm talking more about this populist or popular version of Sufism, uh, where Muslims and Jews go to the same saint. And usually uh, they would go uh, to the same saint to uh, uh, to uh, seek the blessings of the the the, the saint in, in a shrine, and and so uh, if you wanted good props or you wanted uh, uh, like for uh, for women who are for example who wanted uh, children or, or 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 boys not just girls or um, uh, a, a favorable uh, 
court case or whatever, they would go visit a, a saint and it might be a Jewish saint, not necessarily a Muslim, uh, a Muslim saint. So there is no, no difference when it's a saint, there's no difference whether they are Muslim or, or Jew, especially among the, the, the Amazigh uh, communities, the Jewish and, uh, and Amazigh, and Mor and, uh, Amazigh uh, communities in Morocco, they have a very, very uh, common, uh, common uh, Sufi uh, tradition or uh, spiritual tradition cult of saints, which is, uh, very important and it'll take a long time talking about this. In fact, one of the things I really wanted to talk about uh, in, in the beginning, in fact, was Amazir because I'm personally Amazir. <laughs> but, uh, but if you wanted me to say also a few things about that, I would be happy if you have time. So very yeah, happy ab to... absolutely. If you can, I mean, the Amazir is a big community in Morocco and I think it's important yes, for yeah. people who go yeah. there or want to learn about Morocco to realize it's not, like many Arab countries, it's not all Arabs. And there are large communities that are not Arab uh, in, in ethnically, at least, don't consider yeah. themselves Arab. So yeah. uh, absolutely, if you can tell us a little bit about the Amazigh. Yeah, uh, all right, yeah, it's, it's very difficult again to talk about my culture. Because, you know, being Moroccan does not mean uh, an ethnographer. Being wrong, I need to do field work just like you. And I ask sometimes the same questions that a foreigner would ask about my question. I was doing, I was giving a talk on uh, the, this bride market in Morocco, Amazir bride market in Morocco. And lots of questions when I was talking to Moroccans, they said, we, I, I, we didn't know we have this in Morocco. It's completely different from, different from anything you know about the Arab world. So, uh, 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 so, uh, but this will take, this would be a, a, a distinct lecture uh, on its own. Uh, but, but for the Amazigh people, in fact, they are called also Berbers, but the Amazigh people hate to be called Berbers because of the connotation with barbarism, um, uh, especially with the Romans when they started calling them Berbers. But, uh, but the Berbers, uh, they call themselves, themselves Amazigh and Amazigh, simply means free people. And it's a distinct language. And we have the biggest community of Amazigh people in, in, in North Africa. So 45% uh, uh, used to be much more than, than this. But, uh, for the moment, it's probably 45% of the Moroccans are Amazigh. And it's been uh, officially uh, uh, in, in 2011, Amazir came to be uh, the second official language of Morocco. So now it's in the constitution. It's a major influence in Morocco. And, um, and in fact, the Amazir people have their own culture. And to understand this culture, as I've said, you have to unlearn what you know about the uh, Arab community, because they speak a language of their own. Uh, they have the uh, culture. When I, I was, when I see, you can see probably on the, so this is the Amazir dress that hasn't, the, even the veil, the veil, the veil has nothing to do with the Muslim veil. It's an ethnic veil, like the dress code tells you about the tribe. Whether you see the tribe, the dress, the, even the veil, and you know which tribe they came from. Because among the Amazir people, the, the tribe matters. And it's very, the tribe is much more important sometimes, at least in the past, much more important than the nation. People used to be affiliated with, sorry? Yeah. Before we go to Amina, I got just one question here for you. And I know somebody mentioned uh, how their rabbi has been a uh, friend with Sufis and, and the relationship between and how, how it's become you know, very connected. But I have another question from my soon Matar who says, how is the relationship between Sufi and the government and our you are Sufis accepted as a practice of uh, uh, in in Morocco. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, you know, uh, th this is a great question. And in fact, uh, again, uh, the Moroccan why why Sufism is important to Morocco because um, uh, Sufism is accountable for the spread of Islam in the rest of Africa, especially Western Africa. So it's the Sufi orders that that spread Islam to the rest, especially Senegal. For, for example, Senegalese, uh, when they come, and there's a very important tourist uh, 
community coming to Morocco and lots of you now tourist guides in Fez, they started speaking Wolof, not just French or English, or, but for them now they started teaching, uh, uh, Wolof has started to become very important. So, uh, so Senegalese, they go to pilgrimage in Mecca, but they have to come to Fez so that their pilgrimage is complete to see how important. So the Fez is a pilgrimage uh, site because the, the, saint, the patron saint of the, uh, of the uh, Tijani order is, is buried in, in Morocco. But in fact, as I've said, over the last uh, couple of decades, Morocco, the Moroccan state is promoting Sufi orders for lots of reasons, because if, if I want to, to sum up Sufism, I would tell you one word that would sum up uh, Sufism, it's love. Love, this is a very, very important interfaith, and interfaith dialogue. And because of this, the Moroccan state promotes Sufism because it, it brings people That's together the from all over. Way to, to finish our conversation, please wait with us. Hopefully, we'll have time at the end uh, for, for another quick, uh, sure. quick catch up. But now we're moving to Amina. And yeah, Amina um, is the director of projects at the High Atlas Foundation. So establishing and supporting women's cooperatives and associations. Um, hi, Amina. Welcome. Thank, thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting us. And thank you also for Adina for the invitation. Uh, my name is uh, Amina Hijami. I am working with High Atlas Foundation uh, since 2014. I started uh, in the beginning as uh, it's like volunteer for one year in 2013. And uh, now I manage uh, in the beginning just one project and now I am director of uh, five projects. And uh, uh, for us as Hayatas Foundation, we work in uh, Al Morocco. In the beginning we work, uh, we started uh, in uh, Tobqal Commune. When uh, the president of Ayatollah Foundation started, he, his name Yusuf Benmir, and he is uh, from Peace Corps volunteer, and he started creating Ayatollah Foundation in 2000, and now it's uh, bigger, and we're working in Al Morocco, and uh, we're working uh, with uh, women, with men, with children, with youth. So in different projects, you can ask me why different projects because for us. We use it, uh, it's like method that uh, the name of the method, it's a participatory approach. So we meet a community, we do, we did with them participatory approach uh, to know their problem, their solution, and what is uh, their priority. And by the, the, the priority, we understand their project and we support them until implement their project, even women or men, or it's like, uh, any project that they want and uh, the, the project uh, you have many projects that I atlas foundation uh, it's like work in one of them it's the big big project uh, concerning planting every year's more than million tree and organic fruit tree and we distribute it to the farmer to school uh, we plant it with the, it's like uh, with association with cooperative with the direct with farmer and uh, every year we fill our nursery. We have uh, now uh, 11 nursery and we are planning to complete uh, 12 nursery in Morocco from uh, seven uh, provinces in Morocco, the house province, uh, Azilal province, Fes. Uh, we work also in Warzazat, in Tarudant. We have top project in this regard with women. We work with them in nursery. We support them now, we train in them, we support them, and now we manage together a nursery of fruit tree and medicinal plant. And uh, uh, it's like uh, we have with them a lot of projects. And also we have, uh, it's like empowerment of women. Yeah, the, uh, I see some uh, picture with uh, Dina and uh, the woman. Uh, so for empowerment of women, uh, we support them. This is one of our train, our nursery that uh, we work with in, in this, before this picture, sorry. Yeah, with the Sayyid Rahim Baddah. This is one place, it's 
similar and, and uh, we have partnership agreement with Jewish community that give for us this land and we plant in this nursery every year uh, 35,000 of organic tree and mostly it's like fig, uh, pomegranate, uh, almond, uh, carob. So uh, it's like from 2012, we started this nursery and we, st we still working in this nursery. And uh, by this nursery, we have other partnership agreement with Jewish community in Wardazat, exactly in Aguim. And this year, with in partnership agreement with, with Indiash, with the governor of uh, Wardazat, with the water and forest. And we started now to plant in seed in this nursery. We started just, we opened it uh, and we have big event uh, just uh, last month. And uh, our Amina, vision. Uh, Amina, I, I know you also work uh, with the Amazi community. Can you tell us what you do with them, with your organic? Yeah, yeah for uh, uh, mostly our work, we work with the Amazi community and uh, with rural area because. In rural area, mostly Amazigh people, and in uh, the mountain, it's Amazigh people. One of those pictures that I saw now, it's cooperative of women, and Adina bring support us in this uh, regard. Uh, she brings it's like group of, uh, uh, it's like touristic, uh, and uh, they find women just they started their project. Uh, we they want to create cooperative of agriculture. But in the beginning, they want uh, it's like uh, uh, to start their project, but they don't have it's like income for started. So uh, by the service that women giving, uh, they making couscous, they making uh, it's like food in the day of the visit, and uh, the group and Adina support us in. Uh, I I cannot forget this day in 2015, and uh, the woman started their project, and now they started exporting. Uh, it's like a biscuit uh, to France and uh, the ex sorry, they export mini medicinal plants. And now they have a nursery of uh, more than two hectares. So uh, they are now more autonomy and they are, uh, we do with them also, it's like a training concerning empowerment of self that including seven area of life, uh, emotion, and relationship, money. That's yes. awesome, and I can I can I can imagine taking. I mean, it's what we try to do wherever wherever we work. Taking people to visit these organizations, be able to support these cooperatives like the one we have here in the photo. Eat with them, uh, uh, spend time with them, which mm -hmm. which is very uh, powerful experience. But I wanted to ask you, Amina, about women women in general in Morocco. I know in each Arab country women have a bit of a different experience mm -hmm. in the Middle East and it's true in North Africa. I've been to Tunis, for example, where I felt women rights were way ahead than many of the other uh, countries in the region. But I don't know much about Morocco. What's women situation in, in Morocco? Uh, for women, sorry, <laughs> I don't know that. Uh, uh, for women uh, in Morocco, uh, it's like I see them that they are changed. Uh, it's not like in the past. Uh, mostly women in the past, they are not have the opportunity of education, and they are not. Uh, the com it's like the society don't understand that the importance of education. But now I saw them that they are changing. Mostly, it's not. We can see all of uh, girls have opportunity to education, but now uh, the situation change, and uh, uh, we can see more than fifty percent of girls go to school. But for the women that they don't have chance to go to the school now, they trying how to work in cooperative, how to create association, because they see, for example, other example, and uh, now in television or they heard about experience of women and they want also to change their self or to change their situation. But uh, they face problem, who can support them? Uh, they need uh, training, they need uh, someone to support them. Even 
they find someone to support them concerning it's like uh, uh, marketing their product, but they are not enough for us. We focus mostly in how to empower them to be more power to it's like and to be more autonomy. And uh, we have uh, this group of women, Adina uh, visits them and she uh, buy the first carpet for them. I, I think la last year, Adina and uh, today, I am with them just today. I spent with them all the day and I will spend them the, the three day, next three day for empowerment of women to, uh, it's like to empower them because we find them that they have great experience concerning carpet and uh, they have, uh, it's like, they don't, now they have the vision of natural carpets. So it's like uh, uh, dyeing carpets, uh, it's like by natural, and uh, but they need mini training concerning uh, to create a cooperative because they don't they are not have statue so we will support them concerning uh, training to support them to create cooperative and also we will spend with them today and the three day concerning empower them to create the vision that they want it's not the society that they want because mostly they face themselves that they are not more power to marketing uh, to communicate with people to start the, their uh, cooperative so we will spend yeah. with them for yeah. days that's so, that's, yeah. that's amazing uh, mm -hmm. and i love the the photos of the final product in uh, in the photos and families working and uh, I've, mm -hmm. I've worked in similar projects and in other places and it's it's always amazing when women even women who didn't get to go to study in yeah. in university and college how they become the backbone often of economy even in these small villages because yeah. the moment you provide them with with work they become the breadwinner and it gives them so much more uh, more strength and more power in these okay. communities and in decision making i've seen it even among refugees uh, women refugees and how they um, kept their strength and autonomy by being able to make a living and not just depend on either aid or just on their husbands providing. So all, all respect for, for the work you are doing. And, and like I said earlier, I think for, for me, when I'm traveling, I know I wasn't in Morocco, but when I was in Tunis visiting women who were doing this kind of work in a village in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of nowhere, and just... Mm just the architecture of the houses and being inside and feeling the work and drinking tea there and talking yeah. about what does it feel to live in one of those places is just mind-blowing and and really changes your perspective we are bringing back everyone for the last few minutes again if anybody has a question please please uh, this is a time you can ask us and uh, we can bring back Adina and bring back Sadiq together. Uh, if, if we can exit the PowerPoint, Adina, so we can see you guys uh, back in the screen. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, just in addition, sorry. Yes. Uh, for, for mostly those women that uh, they are work with them, we provide for them literacy classes. Because for uh, for this group, we started with them just one month. For the women uh, of 33 women of cooperative from five village, we started them. This is the two years, and now they know how to read their name, how yeah. to write their name, how to write number. So they change in and define themselves that they know how to put, for example, to contact someone. To, so uh, they come back to learning something for them they don't know it but they, they feel that they achieve their dream about learning because mostly of them uh, they are not have chance to go to school but uh, by the literacy classes uh, they understand a lot of things and they know a lot of things thank you so much well that that sounds amazing and and hopefully will help them close the gaps that uh, that they've been missing through the years uh, I, I, I love it. Um, I think uh, we haven't gotten any questions yet, but I, we always like asking uh, if you have a favorite spot in, uh, in Morocco. 
if there is a specific place that you know you would if someone is coming you'd say you have to go here um and i guess that's for for all of you uh, medina do you want to start uh that's very challenging <laughs> There's not one spot, but I personally love desert. So, and I think Morocco has a few different types of desert. So I think if, even though imperial cities are amazing and a lot of culture, if somebody goes to Morocco and doesn't see the desert, I feel like they're missing something. But then again, they have to see everything. <laughs> and, and that everything, can you really see everything? I and mean, in Morocco no. is huge, you can't and you one can't really get to see even a fraction of the country especially not if you want to interact with people along the way you can't well you can't do it definitely not in a week or two right. but you can get a good taste and again when you meet people i know that the groups that i've brought the things that they've seen amazing things and these are people who are oftentimes well traveled and when they their reflections at the end the things they remember the most you're seeing two of the people they remember the most here so they remember interactions with the high atlas foundation people and they remember interactions with sadiq in his home and there's another home that i often take usually i sometimes take them to the family's home or to another somebody else who i know so when they're interacting with people that's what they take away um but it all goes together. It's a package deal. You have to see some of the, you know, other stuff to, to appreciate every part of it. Yeah. Understood. <laughs> yeah, can, Amina. Okay. Uh, for me, as Adina mentioned in the beginning, that uh, Morocco have it's like it's like biodiversity in Morocco. You can see the mountain. You can see the desert. You can see the sea. You can see different culture it's like uh, different religion in one time so uh, just we can oh, see loads your favorite spot uh, amina when you want to go somewhere where do you go uh, for me uh, if you go for me we can see many places but i can see uh, marrakech region because just it means uh, if you are in marrakech it means uh, artisana. You can see artisana. You can see folklore in Marrakech. You can see it's like one hours. You can see the mountain. You can see also uh, five, uh, five five hours. You can see the desert. Uh, two hours. You can see Isawira. You can see sea. So it means uh, it's very central. Yeah, it's very central, and you can see different view and different uh, culture and different project. And for me. It will be great moment for me if you spend it with women. Uh, with uh, it's like uh, you can have it's like good relationship, uh, good it's like communication with them. Uh, because I, I go with many it's like people to do exactly for the village, and I saw them that they are uh, they want to come back and they want uh, to see those women exactly if they, they share with them. Food, traditional food, for example, couscous. Uh, they can share tea they, with medicinal plants. So uh, communication, even different language, but by translation, by just symbolic uh, things, they are more encouraged to come back and communicate. It. Yeah. I think what's beautiful also about Morocco is that you can do skiing in the morning uh, or uh, and and swim in the afternoon or vice versa. Huge as it is. So we have the Atlas Mountains, the beautiful Atlas Mountains, but we have the ocean and the, uh, the, the, uh, the Mediterranean. But I think one place, uh, of course, too many parts of Morocco, I would, I would invite people to go and visit. But I think the since I still am under the uh, effect of 1001 nights, I would invite people to go and uh, do this, uh, the 1001 night and uh, 1001 kasbahs in the desert in, in Morocco. It's just beyond belief. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Adina, we got a question about traveling to Western Sahara. Uh, Is well, it? <laughs> possible can you take people there 
to the Western Sahara and towards now. Okay, so again, we know that there's an agreement as of today with the US recognizing Western Sahara as part of Morocco, but that's that's a touchy issue in Morocco. Actually, probably the others would better answer. So that's something that in some of previous trips, we've had someone talk about someone Moroccan with a degree actually in conflict resolution, give presentations about it to explain, but it's not something that you want to go around talking about and, you know, out loud on your first trip to Morocco with anybody because it's controversial. So even though the US gave its stamp of okay, it, it doesn't make it, um, yeah. So so it's, it's not a place that I go on any of my trips and I don't know if it's even possible for others to go, but I wouldn't recommend as a, tr as a travel trip, unless it's a, you know, more of information thing, a political thing. Um, I don't know if Sadiq or Amina think other, know or think otherwise, but. Well, I think it's safe to travel. Yeah. yeah. Moroccan yeah. Sahara, it's safe. Okay. Uh, it's just up to people with room, but uh, we have uh, huge numbers of people. For example, we have this uh, international conference, mm -hmm. Dakhla, and uh, yeah. so um, it's safe and it's beautiful to go there. Um, more desert. Uh, more desert and it's, uh, beautiful desert. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I had a chance uh, to go with one of our volunteers. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, from America, and uh, we spent there one week. And for its safe, we went to the to Bojdor. It's like in 2018, because we have a, a big project there concerning. Uh, it's like uh, drinking water for nomadic communities. So we go to desert. Desert. It's not just in the center. So more than uh, 70 kilometers from the center. Uh, so she supports me concerning filming and taking pictures. So we spend great moments there. Uh, it's like, um, it's other tradition, other culture. Uh, they give us, it's like uh, different food. So for, for me, it's open because I saw also my friend uh, from France they went to, it's like Dakhla. Dakhla mm. is one of the famous uh, touristic places in uh, Sahara for us. We cannot see just Sahara. Sahara or Dakhla, we cannot uh, see, I don't know exactly the name. Thank you, Amina. Well, uh, Amina, maybe next time you, we... Yeah, exactly. Maybe yeah. next time. Ne yeah. Kim and just I... get rid of COVID and then we'll go. Kim yeah. and I will come oh, home. Yeah. All of us... Uh, all of us on a, on a Western Sahara will take uh, will take our friends here, also Amina and Sadiq, and maybe all of us take a take a longer trip to the Western Sahara. I would love to do it. Uh, well, I, just I, yeah, just um, just reiterating on that note that what Amina says that even though for outsiders when they see Western Sahara people and other Moroccans, they might not see the differences immediately. They might not understand the nuances, but there are so, so many groups with so many different cultural practices and foods and designs. And so it's really a mosaic, even if it, it looks like a mosaic, but even if you mistakenly think two places are alike or two groups are alike, you'll see that there, that there are differences that are interesting. So I'm sure there are. I'm sure, I'm sure there are. Um, well, thank you so much for, for this time. Thank you for taking us to Morocco. Thank you for the amazing photos and uh, really opening our appetite again to travel and to, to go to places like, like Morocco for the cultural explanation, the religious explanation, the, the nonprofit work, Amina, you are doing, which is incredible. This, this was just fantastic. And uh, we thank you so much for it. And then next week, we are going to kind of take us back to the current reality and talk about uh, the Holy Land. And, and maybe, who knows, maybe we'll go also outside the Holy Land, but we'll talk about holidays, COVID, uh, uh, Christmas in Bethlehem, uh, Hanukkah, all of those holidays. How do you deal with it through COVID? And we'll have some of our people come in and, and talk about it. And uh, yeah, um, happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, whichever, uh, whichever <laughs> words you prefer <laughs> for these holidays. But we'll, we'll go through that next week. Thank, Thank you very much indeed for having us. <laughs>
Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. People, it's not where we travel, but it's how. Have a and good. With whom? Okay. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Bye.